So while we're waiting for others to log on, um, did you get a chance to look at the great conjunction between Jupiter and Saturn? So I was at the church the other night on Monday, and I took my binoculars with me, and I was out on the south side of the building, and I was just enjoying uh, seeing, you know, two the two separate planets, and and uh, you know, and just how they were moving, you know, just one was moving closer, and pretty much um, watched them get aligned. So it was cool. It was kind of a neat thing. I hope you had a chance to see it. <laughs> Y'all ready for Christmas? I'm supposed to have um, our younger son and his wife here. And that'll be that'll be nice. So. We have decided we were supposed to have our Christmas Eve service in Seminole City Park, but we have had to change that due to the weather forecast, and we had to make a decision today. And um, so we've decided that we are going to have the Christmas Eve service at the church instead of at the park, same time, 5 p.m. But... Um, I'm disappointed because I was really looking forward to that, but on the same hand, um, we have an awful lot of electronic equipment that we just can't have out in the thunderstorm, <laughs> and that's what they're predicting So, for the times in which we were going to be there, so um, another time. But we were really blessed to have the musical there last week. That was, that was amazing, so well, the weather was nice, and it was cool, but it was nice. So this evening we're going to be looking at Revelation uh, chapter 12. And if you uh, haven't opened up to that, go ahead and do that. If you remember um, last week, we uh, talked about how John was sent to the temple to measure and uh, and to you know document how many worshipers were were there, and all of it demonstrates ownership. Um, and then we read about the two witnesses and talked about that a bit, and how they uh, were sent by God to speak truth, and um, the purpose was repentance. God wants um, the people to repent and turn toward Him. And, um, and the uh, people hated these witnesses, right? Just couldn't, you know, wanted to destroy them, but the only one that was able to do that was the Antichrist. And, and they lay dead for three days, and then God resurrected them, and they ascended back to heaven. But they fulfilled uh, everything that God sent them to do because they were to speak truth and speak boldly um, God's heart for commands. Hi, Miss Sharon. And, um, and so we know that that's kind of where we left off. The um, seventh trumpet um, put things, final things, into motion, and we, took, we talked about that at the end of last week's uh, lesson. So that means, you know, the, the uh, world of finance, the world of, hi, Denise, the world of cult, the culture itself, the, the government, um, everything. Everything's going to shift to the righteous rule of God. And that's basically where chapter 11 left off. And, um, you know, one of the things that we got to always remember in portions of the book of Revelation is that there are these gaps, right? They're, they call them, you might see the word interlude. And so we might be talking about something that's very earthbound and, and very specific, and then we, we see the heavenlies or the throne room or what's going on in the heavenlies, or tonight we're going to know that there's a war going on in the heavenlies. And so there are these gaps. And so when you read the book of Revelation, you kind of sit back and go, like, is all of that happening, like, very close to one another? And the answer is no. 
um, there's no way to know when, you know, when each thing really happens. And, and as much as we like to study, and as many theologians have studied uh, the book of Revelation, no one knows, no one can predict. And there are a lot of different opinions, certainly, about how it all translates to. So it's an interesting um, journey. And you have to keep your thoughts open and you have to invite the Spirit of God to bear witness when you've heard the truth. And you have to realize that a lot of it holds life lessons that are very practical for us. Um, we might not understand all the symbolism. We might not uh, understand the entire picture or the time frame or how long each of these gaps are, these interludes, if you will. We don't know that. We don't. Um, nobody does but God. But we can sit back and go like, okay, like that could have happened at this time because it's similar. Or, um, you know, you can sit back and go like, wow, you know, like this is really getting close and I just need to get my heart ready and make sure I'm watching for the, uh, Christ's return because he's coming. So let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer, and um, we will get um, looking at chapter 12 for this evening, okay? And if you have questions, go ahead and, and try to let me know what they are, because I'm excited to, to see what your thoughts are. I'll try to answer them. Um, and if you want to email me, that's fine too. But let's open with prayer, and let's just get started in this. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this evening. What a beautiful day you have created for us to enjoy. And we just thank you for it, Lord. We thank you. What a, an, an awesome uh, day to be alive, to be your child, to be filled with your spirit, to have opportunities to love others around us. Just a beautiful um, way that you have created us for such a time as this. And so we just exalt you and thank you. And Holy Spirit, we just uh, pray that you would um, not only inhabit us, uh, Lord Jesus, in our thoughts, but just connect us together in your spirit. We thank you that you are not hindered by time and space and that you can do that. So we ask for you to connect our hearts with yours and help us to better understand um, the lessons that you have for us to learn this evening. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, we saw that, uh, that uh, there is this... Um, what do I want to say? This righteous rule that is coming, right? But you know that in order for righteousness to come and rule the earth, the enemy is not going to just like go like, okay, it's your turn now. There's going to be a war. There's going to be a fight. And we see that in tonight's lesson. There is uh, a lot going on in the heavenly. So, you know, I have to ask you this. You know, a lot of times because we are so temporal in our minds in other words we just we earthly in our thinking we, you know like this is this is reality and it's really not the greatest reality is with god but um you know a lot of times we get our minds set on the things that are going on in earth or or how we view things from an earthly perspective and the beauty of john's writing in the book of revelation is he gives us both you know, he's on earth, you know, and then God takes him to heaven to see things, and then he comes back, and then he, he communicates, and um, it, it's, there's so much going on, and yet this evening we're going to see that this is probably, as far as a timeline, and again, nobody knows, but it probably takes place during the last three and a half years of the tribulation. It probably takes place during the Great Tribulation, more than likely, just by the descriptives of things. But it also leads us into that. So um, when we are talking about uh, certain areas of characters that are playing a part in, in this whole um, passage, and maybe even several chapters, maybe the next few chapters that we study, they're the same uh, characters, biblical characters. They are um, more than likely uh, advancing a cause during that last three and a half years um, until uh, the end of the Great Tribulation. So, some of the characters, who are they? 
Let's, let me just kind of rattle off a few of them, okay? The woman. We're going to look at the woman. Um, and she represents Israel, more than likely. I believe that with all my heart, actually. Um, the dragon represents Satan. And you're going to read some of the descriptives that, like he has seven heads that represent world kingdoms. And we can talk about that if you want to, but we don't have to. Um, but basically, um, you know, there is this uh, power struggle and um, and then these governments are taken over by um, the Antichrist. There's the man-child. The man-child. I believe that refers to Jesus, but not everybody does, and that's okay. But um, I'll share some of my feelings of why I believe that. The angel Michael is one of the um, main figures in the Great Tribulation. He's the head of the angelic hosts. There's the offspring of the woman that represents probably the Gentiles who come to faith during the tribulation. We won't see too much of it um, this evening. In fact, I think it just steps into this section, but in the next few weeks, we'll, um, week after next actually, we'll look at the beast out of the sea that comes out of the sea, that represents the Antichrist, um, and then the beast uh, out of the earth, that's more than likely represents the false prophet who promotes the Antichrist. So let's start with Revelation 12, and, um, and we'll see some of these main figures um, being spoken of. And like I said, we're, I certainly don't have all the answers, but I have uh, read a lot in the last... Um, three months uh, about it, and I'm hoping that if you have questions that I don't cover tonight, that I'll be able to find those um, thoughts and share them with you um, as you ask them. So Revelation chapter 12, the woman and the dragon. Then I witnessed in heaven an event of great significance. I saw a woman clothed with the sun, the moon beneath her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. Now, the, that is descriptive probably of the 12 tribes uh, of Israel. Verse 2, she was pregnant, and she cried out because her labor pains, of her labor pains, and the agony of giving birth. Now, the book of Revelation, as well as a lot of portions of Scripture, um, they have women uh, representing a lot of times religious systems. That's just kind of how it's uh, written, good and bad, right? There's Jezebel. Uh, she's associated with a religious system that promotes false teaching. There's a great harlot. Uh, she's associated with a religious system that uh, promises false religion. There's the woman that's known as Israel. Um, how about the bride of Christ, right? The bride. It's reflective of, uh, you know, symbolic of, of a woman image, if you will. So that's the bride is certainly the universal church of the believers. Um, Israel has a biblical theme and a struggle throughout scripture while waiting for deliverance, doesn't matter where it is. It was in Egypt, it's in Babylon, it's Assyria, it's you name it. Uh, there is that imagery of deliverance, you know, and ag so they're waiting and watching for this deliverance and there's this agony and trauma that uh, ensues all the time. So that is certainly, um, going to continue to go on in our passages as we finish even um, even today. The pain that um, describes, um, you know, Israel's and this woman, let's just talk about the this woman that uh, is pregnant here in this passage in verse 2. Um, you know, like, there was a lot of pain that was going on with Israel 
about the time of Christ's birth. They're under Roman dominion. Think about everything that was going on with them. So it's really hard to, you know, separate all of that. But Israel really is, um, has suffered greatly throughout history and certainly biblical history, um, needing deliverance. And, you know, and, and it's not just Israel because we all know that um, the people of God are Israel. Um, but it is definitely, um, you know, when you think about even this time where we celebrate the birth of Christ, well, during the birth of Christ, there was a whole lot of chaos going on, a lot of trauma to God's people. Um, and, you know, and Scripture reveals that time and time again. And we see tonight that if we think about it, um, it's more than likely that we can say that Israel has suffered through all of these things, but truly the woman um, giving birth uh, to um, this male child is, you know, is more than likely the birth of Christ because Satan was so busy to try to take him out. All right, so verse three, let's look at that one. Then I witnessed in heaven another significant event. I saw a large red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns on his head. Now, this is, again, uh, an event or a sign. Um, it's not literally a big red dragon. Uh, but it does describe the character and the nature, uh, the murderous, actually, nature of um, this entity, this um, persona, and, um, and the very fact that it claims to have royal authority and wants to be considered a king. And the, the dragon... Uh, certainly is is uh, is Satan, and he wants to have the authority of God, and he has uh, authority on this earth for a short period of time, and then uh, we know that Christ is going to take him down. But there is this imagery that we see time and time again about that nature, right? And and just think about how um, that character, that nature, if you will. Um, has um, brought deception and manipulation to people throughout history and how they attacked the Jews, right? Look at the Holocaust. You know, it's, it's, um, it's an it's a evil spirit that people, uh, you know, welcome in when their hearts are not right. And... Um, and that's basically what is, uh, you know, Satan, that's his MO. That's how he, that's how he works. If people are willing to uh, operate and give him that authority in them, then he has it. But the people of God live for the, the authority of God. And, and there is this battle all the time. Let's look at verse 4. His tail swept away one-third of the stars in the sky, and he threw them to the earth. We know that... Um, Scripture tells us that a third of the angels, when Satan was thrown down uh, out of heaven, the third of the angels went with him. So there's two-thirds of the angels that serve God and one-third that uh, serve are fallen. They're fallen angels, and they serve uh, Satan. He stood in front of the woman as she was about to give birth, ready to devour her baby as soon as it was born. And as I said, remember that King Herod wanted to kill the male babies because he thought that, uh, you know, this Christ child, as some were excited about, would be a threat to his throne. And, um, uh, and so he was motivated by Satan, by that an anti-Christ spirit, if you will. Um, and uh, so, you know, we have to except the fact that not only was Christ's birth a big deal here on earth, but it was a, you know, the whole thing, was a, the whole behavior and activity in the heavenlies was a big deal. 
and uh, Satan is is pure evil. He he's he is absolutely uh, uh, evil from beginning to end, and he there's no change, and he's not going to. And you know, but God didn't make evil. Now a lot of people struggle with that, but God um, he made angels, he made principalities, and he made powers but he never made evil and uh, there's no darkness in him he's not going to do that um, but he did give free will to every creature um, so even the angels were able to rebel against the truth and the authority of heaven and they found themselves judged therefore so if you want to write this passage down and maybe look at it later, I thought this might be helpful to you. But Herod's attempt to kill Jesus as a child, that's found in Matthew 2, chapter 2, verse 16 through 18. Um, it was also fulfilled throughout Jesus' life as uh, Satan attacked him. Um, so the, you can look that up at John chapter 8, verses 58 through 59, and Mark Chapter 4, verses 35 through uh, 41. Verse 5. She gave birth to a son who was to rule all nations with an iron rod, and her child was snatched away from the dragon and was caught up to God and to his throne. So I do believe this is part of Christ's triumphal return to his glory. I do. Um, in other words, his ascension. Psalm uh, 2 9, write that one down. I'll read it to you, but I want you to look at it later. In Psalm 2 uh, 9, it says, You will break them with an iron rod, you'll smash them like clay pots. In Revelation 19 15, uh, scripture says, From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He'll rule them with an iron rod, and he will release the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, like juice flowing from a wine press. The snatching away of the child from the dragon is really reflective of the Spirit's resurrection of Christ from the dead. When Jesus spoke, things miraculously happened, right? That pure word of God uh, will one day be released in the world. And think about how that's going to, um, it says, you know, rule with an iron rod. Well, um, honestly, the word of God is so powerful that it is going to um, affect and and even um, destroy that which is evil. Just by the very nature of Christ speaking, it will do that. Think about when Christ would uh, speak and evil had to leave. And, and he had the power over uh, every wrong spirit, every evil spirit. And, he, and while he was here on earth, he had the power to destroy them. And they were afraid of him, remember? So when Christ comes back, he's, going to, he's not going to withhold any of that. That's all going to go. But keep in mind that um, that's why people need Christ. That's why they need salvation. Because we need to be covered um, uh, by the blood of Jesus and uh, the salvation that only uh, he can give us. Otherwise, we all have sinned and we, uh, when the word is spoken, we are guilty of it, right? But Jesus is there all the time making intercession for us and we know that, praise God. Let's look at verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where God had prepared a place to care for her for 1,260 days, or in other words, 3.5 years. I love the fact that this woman is protected by God, don't you? Even though she's pursued by Satan, she is protected by God. You know, some theologians believe this wilderness place is Petra. I don't know. I don't even know that it is a, an actual um, location near Petra. I don't know. But that is definitely some that believe that. And Petra um, is south of the Dead Sea. It was in Petra in uh, 2012. And it was really quite an amazing uh, place to tour. I can see where it would be a protected place, right? Uh, a hiding place, if you will, 
So maybe, maybe. Uh, at one point in time, they took refuge there. Okay. The Lord prepares heaven and earth for his children. Um, and, you know, Christ wants us to know that. And he said it when he was here. He, if you think about uh, John 14, verses 1 through 3, Jesus says, Don't let your hearts be troubled, right? Trust in God. You trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my father's house. If it wasn't true, I wouldn't tell you that I was going to go prepare a place for you. And so when it comes to the attacks of Satan, God's going to prepare places for us. He's going to take care of us. Um, If he chooses to leave us here, he is going to protect us. And we don't need to be fearful. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, um, Scripture says, the temptations in your life, are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He'll not allow the temptation. That also includes the persecution. He's not going to let any of that go beyond what you can stand. And when you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure it. And, and that's the goodness of God. Those are some life lessons that I want you to grab a hold of tonight. Right? There are so many people that are concerned and fearful. You know, I was going for a walk with Gracie just before the lesson and uh, tonight, and I ran across a sweet friend and neighbor, and, and, you know, I said, are you okay? And she's like, not really. I'm not really. She said, you know, like, you've helped me a lot. You have, you know, and I, and it was, I was so blessed by the fact that she would share that. But she said, I'm just, like, so afraid of the future. And I said, no, no, come on now. It's, you know, if, if God allows things to transpire in the world, um, you know, the way that they are, I mean, he's in control, then he's going to take care of those who love him. He's going to do it. He's promised he's done it in the past. He's doing it now and he will do it in the future. He's a good and loving, faithful Father and Lord. He's a Savior. He's the rescuer, for heaven's sakes. You know, we always seem to think about the fact that God is just the rescuer and the Savior in the spiritual realm, and that is his greatest work, friends. That's Salvation is a miracle. It's a miracle that through the death of Christ on the cross that we can have the living Lord within our physical temple here. Come on, that's a miracle. And that we will not pay the penalty for our sin, that's a miracle. He's made a way. He's protecting us. But he's also going to take care of us while we're in the world, until he's finished. It, you know, I, I mentioned this before, but you know, God decides how long you and I live. He does. It says in scripture that he numbers our days. And no devil in hell is going to change that. That's, that's God's plan. I mean, he, God has a plan. He has everything planned. And so my being afraid is going to rob me of today. I don't want to be robbed of today. I want to enjoy today. And I'm going to look forward to tomorrow. And if God wakes me up in the morning and he says, Here's another day, Mary. I'm going to say, Let's go. I'm going to enjoy today. I'm not going to live in fear. I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to cry and fret over things. I can't. I mean, I will, I will rob myself of, of the beauty of another day where I can touch a life, where I can live and, and um, form even new relationships. I'm a very relational person. I love people. And every day I get a chance to meet a new face or a new person or to say hey and you know I I to me that's an awesome gift right well I don't want to miss out on today just because I've sat back and been afraid and I'm not minimizing or you know misunderstanding why people are concerned I get that I just want them to very quickly give it to God because he's in charge of everything as we talked about last week and we know that he's going to protect us and make a way. Back to our lesson, though. Think about this. 
the woman, she flees into the wilderness where although Satan has authority, God says, oh no, I'm protecting her, right? So that's no different than you and me. Come on, he's going to take care of us. I believe that. I hope you do too. Verse 7, then there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And the dragon lost the battle. And he and his angels were forced out of heaven. You know, Satan uh, in this passage had access to heaven. And we, you know, we know that. Remember when we were doing a study of Job and where Satan was like, hey, you know, like, um, you know, I'm going to do this and do that, and I want to do this and that to Job. And God says, well, you can do this much and then no more, right? You can't take his life. You can't do this. You can't do that. And uh, and we see that uh, Satan was, you know, in in the heaven, in the, in the heavenlies. And so um, we know that he has had, uh, you know, access there. And what's his big job? What was Satan's big job while he's in heaven? Accusing, accusing the brethren, accusing the brothers and sisters of faith. He is the accuser. He's, that's, his, that's his gig, right? That's what he does. And so there's this war in heaven, according to this passage, and the battle is to deny Satan further access in heaven. There's a battle between angels of equal power. There's the faithful angels and the fallen ones. It appears to me, and maybe you think about it from this, but it appears to me that uh, Satan and, you know, Michael, the angel, are both chief angels. Right, one is of the godly angels, one is of the fallen angels, but they're kind of like counterparts. Michael has the responsibility to guard God's people, the community of believers, and the war is real, and it takes place, probably as I said, in the midpoint of the tribulation. Our battle with Satan and any wrong spirit for us personally is always going to be the struggle between deception and truth. Because Satan, he's a liar. He's an accuser of the brethren. He, you know, first, first and foremost, he lies to us, right? And then when we fall for it, then he accuses us. Uh, you know, like, there's just, there's no way to like him, is there? There's just none. He's just evil. It's just evil. And, uh, but that, our battle is, is in that realm. We, we struggle between deception and truth. We struggle between fear and faith. Those are really hard places for us while we're on this earth and that's why we so need the power of God and the spirit of God the spirit of truth and um, the Holy Spirit who helps us to discern wisely and realize um, the deception of Satan you are not without if you if you have invited Jesus into your life and into your heart and seek to make him Lord of your life in other words give him the authority to to uh, guide your life, then you are, um, you have a mighty advocate. You know, you, you are, you've got some major uh, uh, armor there against the work of Satan. You are not a victim at all. You, you actually just have to know how to handle those things. And, um, None of us do that perfectly, but we are learning, aren't we? Because the Word of God teaches us how to do warfare against uh, those things, the things that come against truth and the things that come. Uh, and when fear starts rising up, we go like, oh, wait a minute, that's not from the Lord. I know that, right? I'm not going to entertain that. 
So we have that battle going on. In Ephesians, let's just take a little sidetrack for a sec. In Ephesians uh, chapter 6, verse 12, Scripture and the Apostle Paul was writing this, and he said, we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So he reminds us this is all, there's a whole realm that you and I can't see, but one day we will. So do you understand that Satan looks for those that he can take over. The scripture calls it, he looks like a lion to devour. Who is he after? Is he after evil people or unbelievers in particular? No, he's after God's people. He's, he is on a mission to devour and stop the faithful. He doesn't want you to have faith in God. He doesn't want you to believe. And so he works against you uh, to to lie to you and deceive you and to cause you to be fearful so that you won't hear uh, clearly what it is that God wants to do. He takes a special aim at vulnerable believers, uh, people who are weak in the word of God. Um, He also goes after those who are isolated from other believers. And don't think for a second that this uh, pandemic and this isolation that's been going on isn't just um, a recipe, uh, you know, that Satan's trying to use to to take people um, back from a vibrant faith uh, because they've gathered with other believers or they get together and um, they grow and whatever. People become careless, and the enemy goes like um, So there, there is that that um, we have to guard against. We have to guard against um, all of that coming against us. So I hope that you are staying in the Word of God if you're listening tonight. You are, and, and that you are um, not isolating too much because that is not in your best interest spiritually. Verse 9, the great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with the angels. Now, the Bible describes four different falls of Satan. There's Revelation 12, 9 that describes this, the, um, the second of these four falls. So they go like this. Let's think about this. From, he falls from a glorified state to a profane state, that's a fall. And Ezekiel 28, 14 through 16 tells us about that one. Remember Jesus says it this way in Luke, he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That's part of that. Um, and then there's, the, there's a fall having, he falls from having access um, to heaven, which we're reading about tonight. And then, um, oh, there's more of that. Let me give you a couple other scriptures here. I just happened to notice I wrote them down as I was looking at them. There's um, Job 1, 12, and 1 Kings 22, 21, and Zechariah 3, 1. And then there's the fall from earth to bondage in the bottomless pit that'll take place uh, for a thousand years. That's in Revelation 20. We haven't hit that one yet. And then there'll be um, a fall from the pit to the lake of fire. So there's four different ones there to think about. Verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens. It has come at last, salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before God day and night. Like I said, we need an intercessor. (laughs) I can just imagine the things that Satan accuses you and me of (laughs) day in, day out, you know. And there's Jesus going like, oh, no, 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 (laughs) not not at all. Now, they're in Christ. 
You look at that. Look, the blood of Jesus. There it is. Don't even go there. And, I, you know, like you have an advocate in Christ Jesus who's always pleading your case. Praise God. I mean, that's like such a gift. Such a gift. Because the enemy always wanting to rob, steal, and destroy uh, our standing with Almighty God. And he can't do it because Jesus is going like, stand back. Nope. This one belongs to me. Right? This I bought and paid for this one. Right? The accuser tries to blame uh, believers all the time before the Father, but he, Jesus really does intercede. So maybe uh, I wrote down a couple of these passages, but I think I'm just going to read them to you. Think about this. Right? Hebrews 7.25. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. Forever. <laughs> right? And then 1 John 2, 1. John wrote this to believers. He said, My dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. You know, a long time ago, I remember I was, oh, I was having trouble, you know, feeling worthy before God because there was just so many uh, things in my life that I was, I'd wrestle, right? And there were a lot of times there were attitudes or thoughts or whatever. And I just remember saying, God, I'm so sorry, you know, please forgive me. Help, help me to have a better attitude about this or that or whatever, you know. And I was just like, I'm so, I just can't seem to, you know, yield as quickly as I want to. You know, like I come eventually, right? This is years ago. And, um, but it's, I, we all have the same battles even now. But anyway, it was just so interesting. And during a prayer time, I was, I was just, just so humbled, and I just said, "Lord, I'm just so sorry about where I find myself." And 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 God says, "You know, like Mary, you go on and on, but I don't even see it because when I look at you, I see Jesus." And, and it was just like this light bulb just went off, and I went, like, "Oh my gosh, what an amazing!" gift, right? So you do realize that, you know, the Father sees the blood of Jesus. He sees Christ when he looks at us. And and Christ, that's why Christ is busy working in our lives and he, the work of the Holy Spirit, and he brings us along, right? But when the Father looks at us, he sees us as a finished work, even though we're not finished on the outside. So it was such a a pivotal moment in my faith and all of a sudden I went from sitting back going like I feel so unworthy I just don't perform the way I need to because we all have a performance mindset friends okay it just is part of human nature we, we either perform well and we're egotistical or we perform poorly or we just have just like a beat down false humility uh, that we just don't feel worthy. Sometimes life can beat you down so much that you truly do not, you believe that you're not worthy. But God says, oh, you're my sons and my daughters, and I see you as such, and don't go there, right? Just keep, just keep walking with the Spirit. Just keep moving with the Spirit and let the Spirit do that which only the Spirit can do in your life. And so that was a really big learning uh, time for me. Um, to to see myself in the right way as as not only a finished work but a not finished one and it being that it's God's job to finish Mary it's Mary's job to cooperate with the process so it's a that's a major point of believing that's what that's what uh, it means to be a follower of Christ to be that you know, willing disciple that says, yes, Lord, if you want to do that in my life and you're willing to bring the power to do that, I'm here. <laughs> do that, which you can only do. So it's a good deal. 
All right, so um, verse 11. And they have defeated him by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony, and they have not loved their lives so much that they were afraid to die. This is another picture of believers, right? So we have victory over evil because Christ's victory makes us victorious. There are three keys to the believer's victory over Satan while we're in the world. And that passage uh, helps us to see it. All right, so let's, let's just look at them. The blood overcomes Satan's accusations. We're made righteous by Christ's work on the cross to die on our behalf before Father God. The blood of Jesus helps um, heal our troubled consciences because we know that by his death our sin is atoned for. But only, um, but to only use the blood of Jesus in that way is selfish. So um, we ought to be like the saints that are described in, in, the, in, in our passage, that we need to be um, willing to let God, you know, take down the sin in our lives now, because now's the time. Now's the time. Scripture teaches us that Satan is a defeated foe. So we got to live by that truth because that's what the, the Word of God tells us. In other words, um, because of God's great love for us to lay down his life and die on our behalf, in our, in our place, if you will, then um, Satan does not have power over us. He can try to accuse us. He can try to lie to us. He can try to tempt us, but he doesn't have that power. So the first way was uh, through the blood of the lamb that overcomes Satan. Number two, the word of our testimony. Remember last week I was talking to you and I said, you are a witness and you have a testimony. You are a witness to faith and love in God and you have a testimony. Everybody has a testimony. And your experiences that you have with God you know, a lot of times people hate experiences, especially if they've been difficult or negative in their life. But can I tell you that God uses all things for our good? If we are believers, he uses everything, even our failures, and he's going to use them for good. And he's going to help us to have a testimony. I have testimonies over my failures and I have testimonies over my successes in, in Christ Jesus. And all of them are valuable to the lives of other people around me. I... Don't have any trouble telling people uh, the areas of my life that I've struggled in or failed in or uh, attitudes that um, I still have to you know, like bring into submission to Jesus um, because that's part of my testimony. I, and you have the same um, opportunities for testimony. Whoever uh, you are and however God has groomed you or wherever you have gone in your life, you overcome Satan by your testimony of the faithfulness of God. And the more that you testify about how powerful God is uh, to be your advocate, to be uh, you know, your protector, your rescuer, the more you tell those testimonies to people, the more powerful you become and the less powerful Satan is to you. He, you don't have to worry about it. You overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony according to scripture and according to not just Revelation 12, but throughout scripture, we see that uh, God's people overcome. They overcome because of their, their faith in God's love. They overcome because they uh, pass along the testimonies uh, of their account encounters with God and their experiences with God. They're, they're consistent. The other thing we see in this passage is that the testimony has to do with people's obedience to the commands of God. And I know that a lot of times people think that that isn't a necessary thing anymore, but it sure is. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. So as followers, we keep his commands. We need to be in that place. And so we see that we overcome Satan because we keep the commands of Christ. 
the word of God. That the commands of God are the testimony of God of what He wants for us, and then as we, uh, you know, are obedient to those things, we can testify. And there's power there, and Satan has no power then. We're those witnesses. And then the third thing is that we're not consumed with self-exalting love. In other words, um, we do not love our life so much uh, in this temporal world, in this lifetime, that uh, we forget about eternity. I received a card today from a friend, and um, a Christmas card. And he, in it, he said, you know, like, um, may we keep our, basically, may we keep our eyes on eternity. And I thought, that's it, in a nutshell. We can't just live for this world. We have to keep um, eternity in mind with how we live every single day because we are seated with Christ uh, in heavenly places <laughs> while, we're, while we're even here. So we have to keep all of that in mind as we live our lives. And we know that, um, you know, we can't care more for earthly pleasures than we care for God and His commands of love. We can't do it. That's not how we have power with Satan. You want to have power against Satan and overcome him one time after another. Anytime he comes after you, you go like, uh-uh, not happening, right? Because um, he doesn't have power unless you give him power. So um, he's a defeated foe uh, in the lives of believers as long as we live in that place. So uh, just know that you, we have to make an, a decision about eternity, and we have to be people who care more about pleasing Father God than fulfilling our own earthly pleasures. Doesn't God want us to enjoy our life? Yes, but according to his plumb line. And his plumb line's Jesus, right? And we need to align with him in his commands. Verse 12, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you will live in the heavens. Rejoice, but terror will come on the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you in great anger, knowing that he has little time so in this particular part of the chapter 12 passage, uh, Satan, um, heaven is free of Satan, but the world's got him. Oh, yay, right? And, uh, and until Jesus puts him away for good, um, you know, he, although he is uh, powerful in the force of evil, um, we know that, right? So just take a look at our world, right? Look at the... the um, the evil that permeates, the hatred, the self-love. You think Satan's powerful? Yeah, he is. For those that, that uh, will uh, let him enter in and give him dominion, yes. But for those who say, mm -mm, no, he doesn't have that kind of power. But then, of course, we're going to see that um, we become targets that way. Spiritual battles are real. They're real, but you got to remain loyal to Christ. When the spiritual battles come, and they periodically do, they're dandy. There's been a lot of them this year. Did you know that? <laughs> a lot of spiritual battles this year. I faced a bunch of them. Um, but in light of that, those are the very times that you and I have to stay loyal to Christ because He is our intercessor and our advocate. And we need him working in our behalf and bringing salvation. He's the rescuer, the deliverer, the redeemer, right? He's the savior. And he wants to be in that place with us. And we have to stay in that place in the midst of the spiritual battles. And just for the record, indecision is not an option. You can't sit back and go like, oh, well, you know, like, I, I think I'm going to serve Jesus. Oh, no, I'm definitely going to serve Jesus. No, uh, I think I'll... I, yeah, I know. I'm over here serving Satan again, aren't I? Yeah, no, I got to get back over. It's not an option. Make up your mind that you are going to remain loyal to Jesus Christ and his word. Make up your mind. If you don't make up your mind ahead of time, you will fall. You have to have it in your personhood. You make a decision and you stay in that place. The whole, uh, you know, prayer of salvation is based on a decision. So indecision is not an option. Remain loyal. Remain loyal. Verse 19. Oh, I'm sorry. What am I saying? 13. 
When the dragon realized that he had been thrown down to earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child, but she was given two wings like those of the great eagle. That's a symbolic of deliverance um, based on Exodus. So she could fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness. There she would be cared for, protected from the dragon for a time, times, and half a time. Why do you think that um, Satan hates Israel so much? It's because they're God's chosen, and Israel plays a huge part in God's redemption. They bring forth the Messiah. Israel brought forth the Messiah, the Redeemer. Satan persecutes Israel in order to destroy God's plan for redemption and eternity. You remember in Matthew 23, verses 37 through 39, Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, but he tells them that he will return for them when they are ready to bless his name. I'll read it to you. It says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers, how often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. And now, look at your house. Your house is abandoned and desolate. For I tell you this, you will never see me again until you say, Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. (laughs) God's going to take care of Israel. He's faithful to his people, and he's going to take care of Israel. Let's go on. Verse 15, Then the dragon tried to drown the woman with a flood of water that flowed from his mouth, but the earth helped her by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that gushed out from the mouth of the dragon. (laughs) That's a visual. It says in Isaiah 59, 19, that the enemy comes like a flood. The Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. It's kind of similar to that. Let's keep reading. Verse 17, And the dragon was angry at the woman and declared war against the rest of her children, all who keep God's commandments and maintain their testimony for Jesus. Then the dragon took his stand on the shore beside the sea, which leads us right into chapter 13 when we return. So, We know that um, during the tribulation, the Jews and the Gentiles that come to Christ, they'll be targets for the Antichrist persecution. We know that. We read about the martyrs at the throne, uh, at the altar, I'm sorry, in in heaven. We read that uh, in chapter 6 and 7. We know that God is going to take care of Israel. He's going to take care of the Jews. He's going to take care of the Jews. He loves them. I was thinking about um, and looking towards chapter 13. Um, And we're going to, by the way, we're not going to be meeting next Wednesday, but the following Wednesday. I'll be back. And um, we'll start with chapter 13. But one of the things that went through my mind was just, I'm going to, put it out food for thought. We were, ta- we were talking about it the other day at our prayer time. But um, the vaccines have begun for, you know, COVID. And I was talking uh, to um, one of my sons and, and he had to be vaccinated because he works in the intensive care unit at one of the hospitals. And so um, he's doing fine. He didn't have any adverse reactions or anything, but he said, you know, they're going to have to, uh, mom, they're going to have to track the people who have had these vaccines and they're going to have to, you know, they're going to have to prove before they get on flights, et cetera, whatever, that they've had it. And uh, people coming in and out of the country and uh, traveling, et cetera. And I said, you know, what came to my mind was the vaccine is at one level, but the proof of the vaccine is a whole nother. And I said, are they actually going to get paper, you know, cards or whatever? People are actually going to keep track of, of uh, who uh, has had a vaccine and who hasn't had a vaccine. And, you know, because there's so many ways to be dishonest with paper. I said, it would be interesting if, it comes out that there's a some kind of an electronic chip or something that actually shows that you've had 
um, the vaccine. And it was just such a pause in my spirit. I just went like, oh my, you know, I, you know, you read about the mark of the beast and there's a lot of dialogue, a lot of discussion. People thought they've got this all nailed down and whatever. And I don't know, but I was sitting back going like, wouldn't it be interesting if that is forthcoming as a result of having to prove that you've had it, right? If you're going to, uh, you know, travel or do commerce or whatever it is, um, because people are so afraid. And this is all about control, my friends. This is all about control. And don't, don't miss it. Satan's involved in it. <laughs> He's certainly involved in it. Um, but God's going to protect his kids. So we'll see where that goes. All right. Well, I've talked long enough. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this evening. I thank you for the lessons of Revelation 12. I pray, Father, that we will not only just think about the description of what's going on in, in the heavenlies, because we know that's all going on, but that we'll pay attention to how we live our lives. Help us to have the power, Lord Jesus, to stay and remain loyal to you, to not fear and worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. You'll be giving us grace. If we're here tomorrow, you give us grace. The day after that, you'll give us grace. We do not need to worry and be fearful. We need to be people of faith who believe in your love, share our testimony, live according to your commands, and be waiting and watching for your return because we know you're coming soon. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so again, as I said, we're going to have Christmas Eve service at the church instead of at the park because there's too big of a <laughs> percentage of precipitation. We don't want to be out in the midst of all of that. Uh, so please join us um, at the church for Christmas Eve services um, uh, tomorrow night at 5 p.m. It'll be candle. We're not doing candles. We're doing phones. So bring your phone, flashlight, and uh, we're having communion. I love you all. Blessings.